Hey there, bestie. I'm Lori Ami, your What to Read Next podcast host. Join me as we dive into exciting new reads that'll have you reaching for your TBR pile in no time. From group and mysteries to spicy romances, we'll explore it all and help you find your next favorite book. So grab a cup of tea, cozy it up, and let's discover some amazing reads together. Hi, Ellie. Welcome to What to Read Next podcast. Hi, I'm so great to be here. I'm so, so happy, happy to be here. I'm so happy to have you here. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a long time, long time lover of rom-coms and romance and reality television. I consider myself a historian because I've been there since the beginning. I've, yeah. I've seen it all. I've seen every iteration of The Bachelor and yeah. everything that Bravo has to offer. And then between, you know, watching stories, wa- um, in, in uh, reading so much romance, reading so many other stories. A few years ago, I decided I really wanted to try my hand at writing my own. I was excited for a creative outlet like that. I love this. Okay, so we got to talk reality TV because you might as well. So were you like an MTV VH1 viewer and then transition over to The Bachelor and to Bravo? Or were you like, were you just like Bravo from the beginning? You know, yeah. I mean, I watched Alex Michelle back in the Bachelor days, the yep. very first one, yep. and I was I definitely in college. I watched everything VH1 had to offer. Yes, like <laughs> like a rock of love. But yes. like, where where are we? Where are we having this love uh, with? Yes, with, yes. Oh, well, like you got to think about the the price of the odds was Flavor Flav or Brad Michaels and and, and the love. Yeah. No, I think I wrote a college paper like comparing Tool Academy to some like great work of literary like literary fiction. And my professor had never seen it before. So she was like, Whoa, what is this thing? What is this what is this world that you're describing here? And I'm like, you gotta not be age one. <laughs> gotta go to VH1. They don't make them like that. I, I don't think I, I watch VH1 in almost like almost two decades. Like that's how like they don't make them like they used to. Like it's it's a decline. No. And I know MTV is like I don't know what they do ridiculousness now. That's what they do. Like mm. but they they used to have the real world road rules, the hills, the good beach, and you mm. know I I know like the hills was kind of like opening up for other reality TV shows and all these different things. But it's still like that era of early reality TV is is just something. So. Oh, for sure. And it, like the way the hills kind of goes into the Real Housewives and then yeah. we get everything on Bravo. I mean, I remember when Bravo was like operas and then I would some I, like and I would write after studio. I actually actually I work at Pace. So I did go to a taping inside the actor studio because we used to compete with the space. So that's James Lipton like was the whole thing. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I was so obsessed with inside the actor studio. And then you would see all these famous people in the yes. audience where it's like there's like old episodes like Bradley Cooper's asking a yes. question. <laughs> and so I remember watching all those and then it kind of like, oh, what's this Real Housewives of Orange County? Like, who yep. are these people? And now I just am so obsessed with the way that people have made careers off of being on yes. reality television. Yes. How, like the intersection of what your reality is versus experiencing this like reality, this reality drama that we're all watching. Yeah. And just I've I've been loving that and everything that's been going on with like Vanderpump Rules and Summer House this summer. Just kind of this discussion of like what what is our real life when we live on camera? It's been a real fun look at human psychology. I love to talk about it like this is like, this is the great, this is the great work of our time. This is our Citizen Kane. It is. It is a Citizen Kane. Scandal is like, was life changing in some ways uh, for many people, not just the people who are included, but for many people who are adjacent. Because not only we have to take the reality TV stars, we also have to take the commentary, the the creators that make a living, the gossip. I love Bravo gossip. It's one of my favorite things. I am a paid subscriber of Bravo Cocktails. I know what the tea is oh, happening and all these different things. I've been an early adopter. And so I I love that it's created this ecosystem of like this world that we can actually partake and enjoy and have, you know, you have a little bit of everything. You have your dog drama right now with New Jersey. And then you have like your petty drama about VIP in Dubai. Then you mm-hmm. have, like, what's going to happen to OC? Like, we're bringing back, holy crap, 
And with that whole gossip like ecosystem with Salt Lake City, where we yeah. like accidentally brought a a, a a gossip blogger on the show and like yes. they infiltrated the show and just like how that that felt like the ultimate betrayal for these women. Oh like another God. character had gone to jail and they're like, no, this is the betrayal. <laughs> That's at the, it's so wild. Like, look at the way that that these sorts of stories unfold and. I've just been, yeah, I've just been loving it. And well, and when Scandaval broke, that was yeah. a big day for us, reality addicts, yeah. because people just like at people who just live their lives, like, you know, good, great people who are who are, you know, who like to read who like to read the news. They're they're contacting me and they're like, what is this Scandaval? And I'm like, oh, my time is calm. Let me tell you about this alleyway behind this bar in West Hollywood. First of all, like the explainer of like what Vanderpump Rules 10 years of explainer of all this cheating scandal, all everything's related and all these mm-hmm. different things. And like, I remember March 3rd when the story broke because I got it. I heard the story at 11 o'clock in the morning. And uh-huh. I, I love no, that you know be. the date and where I, you were. The day and, and <laughs> you know where it was. And at 11 o'clock in the morning, I heard the story from Bubba Hockdale. I was like, there's a bombshell. Ariana find out like we were figuring out our like Ra- Raquel and Sandoval and all those different things and then like a couple hours later it break the news and then it just like it goes from there then we see Kristen Jody going to Ariana's and we see all these different things like all this like the cameras are back rolling because we need to know what's gonna happen and then we start going back to the season and be like where are the clues and I love the Bravo mm-hmm. Bettis the early seasons so in case you didn't know what was happening, Bravo was like, no, we're going to give you marathons and we're going to give you an explainer of where you can find this like timeline because we have 10 years worth of food. In. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, I feel like Bravo really rose to the occasion. Like they, they knew really what did. they were they knew what they were sending up and they didn't let us down. And that was really that was really fun. That whole I mean, it was it was tragic, but it was also it was a fun moment in pop culture especially for all of us who have been steeped in this world for so long it was like we got called up to the majors we could like discuss all of our expertise so that was and then I've also just been like I've watched I mean every season every iteration of The Bachelor like I I'm still like telling people like hey have you heard of Bachelor Pat if this could it was this show back in the mid aughts that they had that the the only three seasons there was a prisoner's dilemma at the end and I'm trying to get people involved in the history of that too. So I'm oh definitely I, am an I am, advocate. I am interested in The Bachelor. Except the problem with Bachelor experience is that the the fandom is so toxic. Mm-hmm. Like just it's it, there is not and so I'm a Love Island person. Like I love Love Island. It's just like it's not I think also the path is not to get married. And I feel like mm-hmm. The Bachelor is so heteronormative, like we're gonna get married. Everybody. I mean, yeah, the Bachelor franchise definitely feels like a family member that I can't shake. Where it's just like I, I don't necessarily want to bring other people into present day Bachelor fandom yeah. just because I'm like I, I feel like at this point I've gone too far with these people. I've been in yeah. it too long. I can't leave now. What yeah. am I going to do? They're my family. But yeah, no, I think Love Island is definitely the superior show. Yeah, and, and the couples that come out of that are just absolutely like TV gold. They're just they are. But yeah, the and the thing, friendships, it's such a, it's a really fun show. It's a fun show. And the fact that it's, like, at the end of the show, they just want to be boyfriend-girlfriend. Like, mm-hmm. there's no, like, engagement. They're just like, we're just going to be boyfriend-girlfriend. And it's like, oh, this is, like, back in, like, high school days. They're just like, do you want to be my girlfriend? Do you want to be my boyfriend? Yeah. Well, and it's, like, that's sort of, it's it just shows where we are in time, where that's, it, that's so much more modern yeah, to just say, well, we're just going to end it and we're going to date and we're going to see what happens. Where, you know, The Bachelor started in the early 2000s. Like, I think it was 2002. Yeah. So it was, you know, if we're going to watch people date on television, it must end in marriage or else what yeah. are we doing here? And it just shows the evolution of all these other shows where, I mean, on the Netflix shows, you have Love is Blind where they're they're getting engaged to a stranger. And it's yeah. just... It's so incredible because you're like, what are we doing here? But I can't, I can't look away. I can't. It's a, it's a train wreck that I can't look away. So this is a delightful conversation. So what are you looking forward for Bravo this summer? Like which ones? Now the summer house is almost ending and ending on a bang. Mm. Other shows, are you looking forward to it? Or any things that are like in the pipeline? You're like, okay, I'm excited for this next mm-hmm. year. 
I'm so excited for Love Island USA because yeah. Ariana is going to be hosting. And I actually yeah. really enjoyed last season of Love Island USA. Yeah. I thought it was a fun time. So I'm excited for that. I'm excited for just I really want to know what happens with the OC. I mean, they've really casting wise, they've created the, the greatest drama ever told yes. right there. So I'm ready to see it. Um, and I'm interested to see what happens with the new New York. Now that they're in a second season, because first seasons are always weird. They're always tricky. Yeah. It's people, you know, they're fighting about dinner reservations. And then in the second season, now they're fighting about, now they're starting to have those meta fights where they're fighting about the show, but they're pretending yeah. to fight about dinner reservations. So yeah. there's something, there's really heat behind it. Yeah, so I'm excited for that. It's so about when they talk about the trip to New York and I'm like, it's a reunion. Just say that you went to a reunion. <laughs> Just when you were in the trip to New York and the trip to New York. Well, like it's over here. We know we're smart. I know. I feel like they've started to get a little more comfortable talking about like things that happen at BravoCon. Because yeah. it used to be like, oh, when we were all in Las Vegas, and I'm like, you and you were all at BravoCon. And now they're like, they're just, they're just the fourth wall is gone. We're just yeah. talking about how this is, is a show, which is fine because we've been watching mm. this for 20 years. Like, yeah. It's like, it, it's bound to happen. So. And I view it as like, we're part of this show. So like, talk yes. about, give us the respect we deserve. We're part of that. Yes. Talk about the audience. We're here. We're here. We have something to say. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, do we ever. We yeah. have so much to say. All right, let's talk about four weekends and a, and a funeral, which could be like four weddings and a funeral, but four weekends mm -hmm. and a funeral. What is the elevator pitch? Because it starts with a bang. <laughs> yes. So four, we four Weekends in a Funeral uh, is about Allison who goes to her ex-boyfriend's funeral only to discover that he never told anyone that they broke up. She's enlisted by a family member to go along with the ruse for the sake of his grieving parents, which would be totally fine and a very normal thing to do. You know, we've all been there, of course. Yeah. Uh, if she wasn't starting to fall for his grumpy best friend. Well, you know... That's how, that's the high conflict. That's the hook. And it's like, I mean, and if like, and, you're not supposed to, what else can you have it? I you, mean, who hasn't been there is the real yeah. question. It's very, a very relatable premise. No, but it's, it's, yeah, no, I, I was excited to kind of do an homage to some of my favorite rom-coms. Like, While yeah. You Were Sleeping is just a forever classic to me. And what I always loved about that movie was the way that it's this, you know, it's a zany premise, but we yeah. are talking about loneliness and grief and all of these kind of really deep human emotions that were that are really digestible because we have this like really lovely banter and romance on over here and we have this absolutely wild situation that's going over at family dinner over here and you can kind of deal with all these bigger issues within the safety of the rom-com yeah ah exciting so what was your process of writing this book like how did you end up pursuing this creative project yeah. So a few years ago, I was diagnosed with a breast cancer genetic mutation, BRCA1, which puts me at a significantly higher risk of having breast cancer or ovarian cancer in my lifetime. And it was recommended that I get a preventative mastectomy and eventually yeah. an oophorectomy to protect okay. me from getting cancer. Um, and while I was preparing for the preventative mastectomy, I was just reading every romance novel I could get my hands on. Mm -hmm. I wanted those HEAs. I wanted those I wanted everyone to be okay. I wanted love and joy and fun. But I also wanted to see women have these frank discussions about their bodies and sexuality in a way that I was sort of dealing with internally. Like I was making decisions about my body. I was, you know, at the risk of, of getting too deep into it. I was deciding whether or not to spare my nipples. Like I was making these big body decisions because that's what happens when you have BRCA. And I was really enjoying seeing women talk so frankly about their bodies and, and their yeah. pleasure and their sexuality. But I was really hungry for representation and seeing a woman like me also experiencing a love story. And that's kind of what got me thinking about, hey, maybe I could have something to say in this space. And I've always loved like what I was talking about with while you were sleeping, like I've always loved the way that romances can discuss hard issues because we go into it knowing everyone's going to end up better than they started. So we don't have to worry that there's going to be this big 
cancer twist when you're dealing with a woman who has a predisposition for breast cancer. You know going in that you can feel safe to read this and just enjoy her story because she's going to be dealing with the emotions. You don't need to worry about her well-being. And so that's kind of what got me on this journey with this book. I love this. I love the fact that you're like looking at the journey, but at the same time, like having this sense of like there's going to be an HEA or a happy mm -hmm. now. There's it's everything's going to work itself out, and we're going to leave you better than you started. Um, which mm -hmm. is a nice prem like a nice purpose, like a nice premonition too. Like you know, we're in this journey, and we're going to get better, hopefully. You know, and we'll have this opportunity to have a fun escape or having a positive a place of joy. As opposed to a place of trauma, a place of like feeling like you're feeling like shit and depressed. Like there's something to be said about joy that's just as important as the trauma. Oh, joy is so important. And when I was when I was looking for that representation, I was preparing for mastectomy. I wasn't really looking for like, let's let's see things go south here. I was looking yeah. for what is optimism and joy. Like I want to see people who are experiencing something that I'm experiencing, but I'm not looking to like to see someone's someone's light go down the tube. And there are so many like with prestige, you know, dramas we watch all the time. Like I love an HBO prestige drama, but there is a little bit of me that's like clenched where it's like, ooh, what's gonna happen to this this lovely woman that I just met? Yeah. What horrible thing will befall her? So I, yeah. I really wanted to think about if I was handing this book to myself a few years ago, what book would I want to read? Yeah. I love this. All right. Do you have any book recommendations to share with our audience? Oh, absolutely. So I've been just reading so many amazing debuts this year. This uh, Earlier this year, I read Naina Kumar's debut, Say You'll Be Mine, and her upcoming sophomore novel, Flirting with Disaster, is like a sweet home Alabama in a hurricane. It's so incredible. So definitely have that on your radar for the future. A couple others that are already out. I loved Hannah Tate Beyond Repair by Laura Piper Lee. It's this like hilarious, unflinching look at motherhood with this wonderful romance. Maya Ariel's When I Think of You is this sweeping, layered Hollywood romance. Danica Nava's The Truth According to Ember is laugh out loud, funny workplace romance, and it's featuring an entire Native American cast of characters. And she is a she's chick saw herself. So it's a really incredible work. And then Take Me Home by Melanie Sweeney, this lovely grad school road trip romance. And I don't know about you, but I am back into dystopian in a big way. <laughs> I am. I think they just put the Divergent series on Netflix. I'm like, oh, my gosh, remember that? What a great yeah. time. And so I, Jill 2's The Dividing Sky is like romantic speculative thrill ride that is really yeah. great and comes out in the fall. And finally, I am loving the season of Bridgerton. I'm completely obsessed. I am watching the Nicola and Luke TikToks. <laughs> like, I'm in it. And if you are there too, then Ne'er Duke Well by Alexandra Vasti was written specifically with you in mind. She's so incredible. She has the series of novellas that's already out. And this July, she has Ne'er Duke Well coming out. And I'm just so excited for everyone to discover her. And if you've been loving Bridgerton, it seriously is the perfect next one. Oh my gosh, I'm picking that one up next. But mm -hmm. those are great recommendations. And those recommendations are books on my list. And I'm like, oh, I have this in my list. I have this in my list. So you're just like adding more things for me to read on the side. Gotta add more to the TBR. There's always it is, room. It is always room for more. So Ellie, tell us where you can find online. Yes, you can find me at Ellie Palmer Writes over on Instagram and occasionally on TikTok. And yeah, you can find you can find me there. Thank you, Ali, for being the show. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining me on this episode of the Watch Read Next podcast. If you enjoy our bookish conversations and want more recommendations, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Also, head on over to the Watch Read Next blog for a list of books mentioned in today's show. Happy reading.